Welcome to The Southern Bruja, a bi-weekly podcast dedicated to reviewing horror novels new and old, Latinx folklore, and a dash of all things Southern and weird. I'm your host, Melanie. On today's episode, we are lucky to have author Mark Taus. Mark is the author of numerous novellas and short stories, and today he's joining us to talk about his two newest novella releases, Nana and Hope Wharf. So, Mark, thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I just want to say for people that are listening now um, how appreciative I am of you, Mark, because for those who don't know, this is actually the second time I will have interviewed you. (laughs) Um, However, Zoom did not cooperate the last time and I was unable to um, find the recording after the meeting was all said and done. So you graciously um, offered to come back and do the interview again. And for that, I will be forever in your debt and totally grateful. Thank you again for doing that. You're welcome. Just, just be wary that, that that was my best stuff, right? So what, what are you getting now is the B list. So that, that was that was the the creme de la creme, and ah. it's a shame that it's now lost. It's lost you know, into the ether. Never to be seen again because that was just amazing stuff. I can't I can't tell people how much you know they missed out on that one. But we'll 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 give it a shot and we'll see what happens this time around. Perfect. That, that's all I can ask you to do. <laughs> well, to get started, I'm so full of crap. <laughs> that's gonna be fun. So to get started, um, let's just kind of have you talk a little bit about yourself and kind of get um, people that are just kind of learning all about Mark Taus and your wonderful writing, just a little bit about you and your background. Cool. Yeah, be very quick. Uh, um, I'm originally from Yorkshire in England. I now live in uh, Clifton Springs, which is a quiet little sort of seaside type town uh, Mm -hmm. in Victoria. some elements of that were actually made it into Hope Wharf, funny enough, but we can talk about that later. But um, so look, I, I, I like a surf, a hike, I like a good whiskey, the stars, all that cheesy stuff. But uh, my main passion or addiction is is to write. That's what I love to do. You know, it's what I think about when I get up in the morning. It's what I think about when I'm doing the, the daily grind of the day job, selling advertising. Um, Oh, so, sorry, I should I should have just run down my spine. Um, so I thought, yeah, I, I just I've got a, I like a, to have a laugh as well. I've, I like to think I've got a decent sense of humor, and hopefully that relays into some of the written material that goes out there as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's pretty much it. I'm I'm a very simple man, uh, and it doesn't take much to to keep me happy. To be fair. So you said that, you know, you've, I've heard from previous interviews and kind of your bio that you got into writing a little bit later in life. Um, what kind of led you down that path of wanting to be a writer and just kind of start that, that part of your yeah, life? Good, good question. Uh, got a feeling of deja vu there. Melanie. Do you? So look, yeah, I do. Yeah. It's spooky though, isn't it? Um, <laughs> look, until three years ago, I've written nothing, um, but no element of creativity in, you know, in my mind whatsoever. There was no space for it. I was, I was working long hours. I was drinking heavily <laughs> when I returned uh, from the office. And uh, that, that was my life, basically. I was fitting in. I was keeping fit. That was my focus. That was my main focus was just running. And um, that was, that was mainly to keep the dark cloud away. So I was, that, that was my method of, of escaping the dark cloud, just running. Um, but then, you know, I had this something my English teacher said to me uh, at high school, which was the last time I'd done anything creative. And, you know, she said, oh, you know, you could, you could do really well if you put your mind to it, if you're really focused. And it's, it's always been there. So I, I chose maths. I did a d- degree in maths and somehow drifted into, you know, sales and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, but, yeah, so it was always in the back of my mind. And my wife said to me, you know, why don't you just give it a try? You know, why don't you just see what happens? Because she knew I was there was something missing. Right. Um, so yeah, I did. So three years ago, uh, nearly to the month, I started writing. Uh, I wrote a, a little piece called Hugh's Friend, which sold actually. It was it was it was actually it sold for seventy five dollars, and I was chuffed a bit. I, honestly, I was I was over the moon. You know, it's like oh, this is brilliant, man. I'm I'm doing something I love, and I'm getting paid for it. And that was it, you know, from that moment, I was, I was addicted. Um, and yeah, that the, the rest is history. You know, I mean, I, I just, I've written 120 short stories. I've written seven novellas 
Um, and yeah, there's lots of stuff still going on in my head. There's lots of dark stuff that still needs to come out. So yeah, and you've written for podcast stories. I mean, you've done a lot in the three years. Like I think I talked about with you previously, the low spirit story has always kind of affected me. And I didn't even know that was you. Um, yeah. So when I got the arc from you and saw the name, I was like, that kind of sounds familiar because I remember listening as a fan of that podcast and hearing the story that kind of really kind of got into my heart and kind of touched me emotionally in a lot of ways because it was such a beautifully written and just kind of emotionally just like, I don't want to say bleak, but kind of bleak, you know? <laughs> like it was bleak. It was bleak. It was very bleak. Yeah, it but was. But it was, it it was, was. An excellent story. And um, I just thought, you know, this person really knows how to write people. And um, as a reader, that's kind of what gets me interested in a lot of the the books that I read and kind of um, hooks me to authors is how well they can write yeah. people and make me care about them. And um, so my question to you is, since you are so good at writing people and you do have a really good sense of humor, why horror? What is it about the horror genre that you love or just feel like a connection to that you feel like that is where you need to be focusing? Um, again, a good question. I, I think, well, I, I grew up reading Stephen King, uh, as you know, from my last conversation, the, the first library card I got, it was, it was Kuja was the first book um, I read. And then I just... I just consumed everything I could get my hands on from that point. Um, you know, I, ju I just remember the long summers, bedroom window open, lying on the bed and just just digesting everything I could get my hands on. Stephen King, James Herbert, um, Dean Koontz as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't I don't really know. I mean, I, 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 it's just wonderful escapism. I mean, I did try some other genres, but horror was the one that really that really stuck just because of the, I suppose the lack of limitations and the fact that you can incorporate everything into a horror story um, and you can take, you know, it's, it's a roller coaster of emotions. And that, that sense of humor is important in terms of adding that extra dimension to characters, but then also, you know, taking the readers to a high, you know, they've, they've laughed or they've, they've had a guilty giggle at something and then suddenly taking the floor away. And it's like, oh shit, am I supposed to laugh right now? I mean, this is weird, man. I'm, I'm dark if that's the case. Um, but yeah, it's like, I, I, in terms of, um, horror, I mean, I've written love stories, you know, somebody dies, of course. Um, uh, I've written all sorts of, I've written sci-fi, um, sci-fi horror, I guess. So look, I, I don't know. It just kind of slips in there every time, you know, I might, I might have the intention of writing something Oh, I'll do something different, but then the horror comes. And I think it's just for, for me, I love, um, sort of sitting back to some extent you know, when I'm in the flow and just watching these characters go through the ringer, you know, know, knowing that they have to get from point A to point B, but knowing that they're going to suffer all sorts of torment in the process. But to do that, um, I also have to mix it up a little bit. As you said, Low Spirit was, was quite a dark story, um, quite a solemn story. But then I like to mix it up by, you know, the next story will be something humorous or silly or you know, detached from that, that aspect. And, you know, the, I just, I, I have to have fun with what I'm writing. I have to have a laugh on the way. You know, if, if I'm not sat at the keyboard manically giggling to myself and I feel like I'm doing something wrong. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. It's fun taking people on a journey and, and watching them. Yeah. Suffer. Oh God. <laughs> Did I just say that? <laughs> Did I just say that? Oh my God. I'm an awful man. No, yeah. I think it's, I, I, I see where kind of taking a character from an unknown place to kind of this dark, really scary aspect of life and then kind of perceiving how they're going to either survive this, you know, what kind of skills do they have that can make them overcome this or is it just a descent into darkness? It's very interesting. I think most people have had some situation, maybe not to that extreme where they've kind of been faced with something and it's kind of that defining moment of their life where it's like, okay, this is where it really shows who I am as a person. And I think your characters do that in, in pretty much everything I've read from yours is that that one moment that if you just change one decision, the entire story could go a different way. I yeah. think you write that brilliantly. Um, but something that we talked about once was you had mentioned not having empathy in writing that doesn't belong there. Um, as a kind of a way to detach from writing your characters. So can you tell me a little bit about your writing process and why that's important? 
From that point of view, I think because you do get attached to these characters, because you spend a lot of time with these characters, um, I just feel if, if you invest too much, then the story is somewhat dictated in terms of you then want to protect these characters. You know, you then want to see these characters through to the end. And then if if you can see that, if you, if you can, if you write that way, then I think it's quite transparent in terms of the reader knows that that character will make it out okay. You know, so I, I think from that perspective, there, there's a certain detachment. So you don't fall in that trap of writing, you know, to, to keep certain characters alive or what you think the reader might want to see because the, the last thing you want to do is write something predictable. You know, you, you want to take the floor away, as I mentioned before. And I think by by investing too much, by having too much empathy for these characters, there's a danger that you just kind of, you know, does that does that make sense in terms of just making it too predictable? I don't want that to happen. Yeah, no, I totally um, understand that. And you definitely don't do that in your books as, as a reader and as a fan, um, I can tell you that with everything I've read of yours, you have definitely pulled the rug <laughs> out, but you've written extremely um, likable characters. And it's it's just such a an interesting dynamic because like you said, you, you create these characters and, and you kind of get invested in them and you want them to survive and be happy and you're really invested in what's going to happen to them. And then, you know, something terrible happens. And as a reader, it can be hard to kind of digest that okay this is the path that we're going down now and i i don't really know where this is going but at the end it all comes together very flawlessly and beautifully and it's interesting to hear from the author's perspective that you have to kind of pull yourself away and that you do get attached to these characters and i'm not crazy for caring about what's happening to <laughs> zach and ryan that that's intentional um i think that's incredible and speaks a lot to your writing and your ability to write real people Cool. Look, I think, I think again, it all comes back to humor. I mean, I, I'll say this a lot because I, like I said, if I'm not having fun writing, uh, I don't think the reader's going to have fun either. So I think incorporating that, I think sometimes it's quite missed um, the element of humor because it, it's, it's a human bond. It's, it's something that we're all reaching out for, you know, to smile, to laugh. And I think quite often that's missed. Um, so if you can create that relationship with your characters and extend that to the reader somewhat, then they are, you know, they do become more engaged. It's, it's like the senses. I mean, I think one of the underestimated um, senses is smell. You know, in horror especially, you can create some really, really solid environments through that aspect of, you know, you're, you're in a cave. What, what, what can you smell? What can, what can you add to the mix apart from the fact that you've got the dripping water and you've got the, the glistening? You know, it's, there's something else that you can add to it. And I think humour, again, is, some, is part of that package that's really important in terms of creating that, that relationship between everyone the author you know uh the characters and the reader yeah i think it's great to hear about your process and i also um know that you know at least for my experience growing up horror was always a big part of my youth actually i mean I, my mom was a huge horror fan i grew up in a culture that kind of lends itself to seeing the supernatural as not something strange, but kind of just a part of life. I mean, all of my childhood legends were like a chupacabra is coming to get you or, you know, a cuckoo is going to eat you if you don't. Um, <laughs> that's just, you know, thanks, mom. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'll listen for sure if there's going to be a monster coming, you know. Um, so that was all very much. I feel like that's always been kind of a, a precursor for me into the horror world. It was just kind of how I was raised and then my mom's own interests. And you've talked a little bit about um, your writing process kind of being a bit of a family affair as well. Yeah. So like, but my mom is, um, I, yeah, yeah, our relationship has really come a long way since I started writing because she, she's my editor. She's my go-to in terms of, you know, she'll run through these stories first of all. And um, it's quite funny because you, you look at some stories like Nana and think, crikey, all right, you know, that's, uh, that's pretty far out. Um, far out stuff for, for your mother to to lay her eyes over, but she's got a great sense of humor. I mean, she's 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 a weird one herself. Um, but sorry, mum, but she <laughs> but she really helps. Um, she's got an eagle eye as well, so she'll spot. You know, you can read something a thousand times, you'll you'll still miss something, but she spots it. I mean, she's she's very good at that. Um, but it's also great to get her, especially what you know, in terms of old people horror, because I think. 
<laughs> she'll hear me for saying it, but I think she relates to it quite a lot. And, uh, but, but because she relates to it, she finds it even more hysterical and that works. Um, so from that point of view, yeah, she's, she's, she's solid in terms of, you know, the first person that gets to see this and any critique that comes forward. And it's definitely brought us closer um, over, the, over the last three years, for sure. So that is a common bond. It's great. And, you know, we, we share a sense of humor. And again, that's what, going back to what I said before, humor is really underestimated in terms of the power you can add to the dynamic of a relationship. Now, have you ever had something that she's read and said that's too far? Pull it back a little bit. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she she will tell me. She'll tell me. She'll tell me if it's too much. Um, uh, that there is one scene in a prison. Uh, this was for a a, a, score, a story that's going into my uh, collection uh, called Eric's Tune, and there was this one scene where I, <sighs> prison language. Yeah, it's you know it's not F, you know effing and cheffing. You know it's a little bit worse than that. It's it's next level. So there was, there was one word I used and she just, she just brought me up on it and said, Mark, I think that's disgusting. I think you don't need to use that. I said, yeah, but it's, it's prison talk, mom. It's just, it's how people talk, you know? Well, I don't know. I've not been in prison, so I don't know. Um, but yeah, so, uh, and it was, it was, it was an interesting point because I, you know, I had to sort of evaluate that. I had to evaluate that. Is that, you know, how far can you take the reader on that? You know, is, if I, if I, if I put that word in there, is that going to, you know, lose myself a readership or but so, so that kind of stuff, is, uh, she'll, she'll bring me up on stuff. That's just one example of it. But yeah, sometimes I'll, I'll sort of admit, yeah, maybe I've gone too far at that point. So yeah, there you go. Got told off by mom. <laughs> yeah, I'm 48 and she's still telling me off. Yeah, exactly. So speaking of moms, let's talk a little bit about Nana. Nana was a riot. Nana was a riot, man. I mean, it's, it, was a, it was a journey and a half. Yeah, I loved it. I wrote it in a week. Um, I, was, I just smashed it out. It was, and it was, cause it was just fun. It was just fun. It was, it was to some extent, it was like a holiday from writing because it was just so easy and everything just flowed. And the dialogue, I was, I was laughing as, you know, it just had me in stitches, you know, which is kind of weird, but um, so it was, it was just, it was just that easy to write. And it, they, I enjoyed my time with those characters so much, you know, they, they were weird, they were out there. And because of that, there were no limitations, you know, the, the, you, you could just play with them and you could, you could do anything with them. But it, it originated from the first time um, I helped my boy do his paper round and we ended up down this, down this little quiet street, there's little gnomes and gargoyles in the garden and all kind of weird shit. And um, so it was like a semi-retired, retired place. And we went down this alley and there was loads of black cats everywhere and it was kind of weird and freaky as well. And I always remember it being really overcast, which added to the sort of ominous environment. But this old man came out to talk to, to my son. And obviously he was lonely and they don't get to see many people. So I think he just wanted to engage with youth as opposed to feed off um, some elements of that, but not to the extent that, you know, the novella goes. Um, so it was quite easy, you know, watching this, this interaction between my son, you know, I think he was 12 at the time and, and this elderly gentleman. And it was just, it was, it was just a very bizarre kind of standoff. It was, you know, it was, it was awkward. Um, like two alien species coming together for the first time. And yeah, it, it was just really awkward. So I think it was, it was from that point, I wanted to write something that, you know, took that, that disconnect um, and then took it to the nth degree to some extent, but then also brought it back to say, Hey, we're all just kids. You know, even an old person, but their childlike personality and old person skin. So, I wanted to sort of bring that loop back and sort of like, you know, to, to sort of ground everyone that we're all on the same level, regardless of our age, regardless of all that. We're just human. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's something that was really interesting in reading Nana is these characters were so quirky to the point where you know, you know, they're probably not up to something great, but damn if they're not having yeah. a good time doing it. Oh man, yeah, absolutely. It's so funny because Nana really kind of reminds, I mean, anybody that reads it and I highly suggest everybody reads it, but I, I mean, I know when I would visit my grandmother and I love my grandma, she, uh, we had a language barrier because I didn't speak Spanish as a child. And, 
Um, so our communication was very much kind of that awkward, like, come sit next to me. Uh, let's watch something, you know, and the smells were always a little off. They weren't like my home. You know, everything was just off. And you're trying to bond with this person that, you know, I was maybe eight. And I, I distinctly remember she had given me like a bowl of soup. And I guess she assumed I really like this soup. But literally, Anytime uh, I saw her from that day forward, I had this chicken noodle and star soup. But spe speaking of that, actually, no, speaking of that, because it's it, just the soup connection there, because I, I used to go to my granddad's on a very rare occasion, very rare occasion. And as soon as I got there, he'd give me, he'd get a, uh, out of the sideboard, he'd get a can of Coke and a Mars bar. So that, that was, that was, that was, my, that was his way of saying, oh, you know, you know, yeah, w welcome, whatever. So, and the, the Coke was always flat. Uh, we'd always have flat Coke in. And the Mars bar, it was, it was it, you know, when the chocolate goes white. Yes. But it's been in there too long, which yes. is kind of weird as well. And uh, then he'd do soup for dinner. Yeah. Always do soup. But the soup was, like, he'd make it so thick that you could literally stand the spoon in the soup. It would literally just stand up. And it was just, so that, that those, those are the things that I remember. Yeah, it's so funny. And it, it, I notice it too, just um, you can kind of almost feel it happening in your own life, you know, not to say I'm a Nana yet, but even meeting people a few generations younger, it's like they're speaking sometimes a different language and you're just kind of trying to learn like your place in the world and not lose who you are um, next to these new people. And I feel like the characters of Nana were like that. They were very much hanging on to what made them them um, for, for better or worse. Yeah, absolutely. All of the quirky characters, and I loved Ollie um, so much. Is Ollie in any way kind of in? Was he inspired by anybody in particular, or was he just representing kind of this childlike wonder of again not knowing your place in the world and dealing with family issues and being a child and not really having that control? Yeah, he, he was just a typical kid going through you know the issues of family dynamics, and you know as as we all do, you know your parents go through good and bad patches all that kind of jazz and you know some really bad patches and then so i just wanted to plunge this kid into this this weird world and uh yeah <laughs> and just and just play with that really to be honest with you uh, and it was just yeah i, I can't say no more about that I, I just wanted this normal kid normal upbringing and just plunge him into this this world of creepy oldies and just just see how it all play out just see how it reacts and yeah it's for, for sure. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's never going to be the same again, put it that way. And I, but this is the kind of thing that changes you for life. I think you'll agree. Yeah. yeah. And as for cherry pie, you don't think he's going to go near a cherry pie ever again. No. I probably won't either, to be honest. No. I don't, it hasn't done much for, for the sales of cherry pies. No, for sure. I can't say enough good stuff about Nana, but I can, Thank you. I can say a ton of stuff about Hope Wharf. You'd be willing to talk about that. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. A different, a different ball game, but yeah, still, still fun to write. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's kind of where I want to start. Was Hope War fun to write? <laughs> like it was, yeah, it was. And the, the reason being is because I, I made the, I tried to make the relationship between Ryan and Zach um, fun as well. You know, I, I tried to make it, um, you know, t two kids, one of them adventurous, brave, the other one, you know, towing the line. Uh, but I wanted to have fun with that. And you know, from the sake, you know, just for the sake of creating a vision of them splashing in the water and, and sort of enjoying a summer's day and things like that and the smells of the, you know, uh, the, the water and seaweed and so forth. And then, um, so, you know, using humor to build up that relationship to create the empathy to some extent, yeah. Um, but then, yeah, just, just watching how the relationship um, kind of struggles, you know, through what happens in town and so forth, which we can't say too much about. But um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's watching this. This It is a sort of coming of age aspect of friends that you have. You know, when you're young, you have a really strong bond with and then you go through certain ordeals. And, you know, if that friendship endures that or if, if it sort of fades, really. So, yeah, Hope Wharf was the book that I think of almost everything I've read this year really shocked me. <laughs> and yeah. I, I've told you in like various reviews for this, I had a visceral reaction to the story. It was just, I mean, I, I 
I looked at it. I'm like, there's these cute little kids in the front cover and they're, you know, they're going on these adventures and they're hanging out at the beach and getting crushes on these girls that are, you know, a part of the yeah. tourist attractions. And it's all very sweet, very almost pleasant bill. I don't know how you would say that. Um, no, that's a good comparison to some extent. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Just yeah. this idyllic little town um, somewhere that I would have loved to have grown up in, you know, just kind of that yeah. ideal world. And then when you realize what's really going on behind the scenes and where this is really going, it just floored me. And I, I really did not see it coming. Like, that was originally a short story, actually. Uh, oh. A 9,000 9, word called The Seaside Lolly Shop. But it, it just it just it just outgrew that. You know, it, you know, the, yeah. it's a small town, but it has got one hell of a secret. And um, yeah, it, it was, it was, it was too, for me, I, it was too good an idea not to, you know, to try and condense it into, into a small short story. And yeah, so it allowed me to go, you know, free and, you know, I just, I just love the aspect of these two kids, you know, getting out their pajamas uh, at midnight, you know, packing a little, backpack full of snacks and stuff and then going on this adventure to try and try and find out if the secrets or the rumors about town were true and it was yeah it was a lot of fun to write it was a lot of fun to write um but it was great pulling the floor away at the end for sure you captured like that childhood innocence so well that um yeah, the, the the twists and turns in this story really definitely got me. And I mean, this is probably one of my, my favorite things I've read ever. And I, I mean, it's oh, just wow. I, okay. I really cool. love Hope Wharf. I talk about it as much as I can on the podcast. I just I think everybody should read it, especially if they're um, interested in kind of seeing this evolution of a character. I mean, to a point that you just I really could not see it coming. And um, it was just brilliant that I let it. I closed the book. I breathed and then I started laughing because I could not believe that I'd just gone on this adventure, <laughs> you know, and made it out the other side. I think that's it. Because I think if you if you manage to develop a good relationship with the characters, I think you do blindside the reader at times because they're you know they're, they're invested in these characters and the, the last thing they want to see is something bad happen. You know, it's like they know they know it's coming, so but they kind of like just push it to the side. They push it on the carpet for the time being uh, because they just want to engage in this in these characters and just see how they develop. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's kind of cool to do. It's just, yeah, blindside the reader to some extent. There are enough, enough subtle hints in there, I think, but not enough to, to, um, to prepare them <laughs> for what's, for what's in store. Yeah. Yeah. And it's great. There's like elements to me of kind of like town folklore, um, kind of that kind of folklore storytelling where kids yeah. were kind of telling the, the myths and the legends of their town, um, you know, they're kind of growing up in this very isolated community and they're that's all they know. Um, and I, yeah. I felt like that was almost so interesting because you have these children that really want to explore the world outside of their, their kind of box and who doesn't want to do that. Yeah, absolutely. There's just so much that you can relate to um, through so many parts of this or, or feeling like, you know, you don't really matter in your town. You're not somebody that anybody really pays attention to or would notice anything about you. And then to have an opportunity for that to change, like, would you take it? Absolutely. Yeah. It's a good way of putting it actually. Yeah, for sure. It has that, that, that coming of age innocence to it, kind of like a stand by me vibe. Yeah, absolutely. But mixed with a bit of The Wicker Man, because I, I, I love The Wicker Man. That, that was one of my favorite films, to be honest with you. And it's just so strange and, and sort of surreal. And yeah, I, I, that's, that's definitely with my top three favorite films. And I think that it definitely had, like, maybe not um, consciously, but it definitely had an influence, I think, in that one. Yes. And the way you wrote the town had a very dreamlike quality. Like at points I couldn't, I couldn't even tell if this was really the way it was, or if I was just seeing it from the perspective of the character as kind of just yeah. like idealizing this town yeah. and this area you're able to take a story and completely turn it on its head yeah it, it is a, a definitely what you call a panster i mean i very rarely do i know what's going to happen at the end of the story which is kind of a, a bizarre notion uh but i i like to take an idea a location and then just see where it goes uh, the idea behind that is that you know if i don't know what's happening or, or where it's going to go then the reader has no idea so it's an inevitable blindside for them um I think the thought of writing with an ending in mind, which a lot of people will disagree with, I think is quite a rigid way of writing. It's very linear. Whereas if you're if you're a panster, you know you, you take you can take all these different paths. You're free to wander off the path, and yeah, you'll, something's waiting to be discovered around the corner. And I love that aspect of it. 
Um, but yeah, I, 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 don't, I can't envisage writing any other way. I, I just have to have fun with it. And to, it has to surprise me as well. I think that definitely shows in the way you write and the product that you produce. It seems like you had fun and you definitely make sure that your yeah. reader is having a good time on this adventure. Even knowing where this may head or, or lead, you still make us want to go on the trip. I love, I'm very old school. I, I like a story with a twist. I do. I like a story with a sucker punch at the end. I do. I'm, I'm very, I grew up watching, you know, Hammer House of Horrors, Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, so I, I, I'm very old school from that point of view. Do you feel like horror is kind of having a moment like it had a while back in like the 70s and 80s or the Hitchcock era where, you know, there were kind of all of these stories that became very popular and in, it was in film and in book. And it kind of had a heyday where horror was really kind of the genre. I feel like that's kind yeah. of coming back around again. And there's an appreciation for for the storytelling aspects of it that, you know, sometimes for a while there, people would kind of act like horror was like a throwaway genre. But I feel like now yeah. it's kind of getting the respect that it deserves. Um, do you kind of feel like you're kind of helping ride that wave and kind of making that, this genre just better? I thought that there are some amazing authors out there at the moment, uh, absolutely amazing authors. And yeah, I, I think I think it's definitely going in the right direction um, because horror you know, conjures different images in different people's minds. I mean, some people think horror and some people think slasher fest, you know, like buddy Jason and Freddie and whatnot. But you know, horror doesn't have to, horror can be psychological, horror can be very subtle. And I think people are beginning to appreciate that. So I know we've talked about a lot of characters and, and the way that you developed them, but of all the characters we've written or are writing, is there one that stands out most to you as kind of your favorite character? Yes. And I've literally just finished this novella today, this morning. So I, I went through the final edits and I've uh, sent it off. Uh, it's a guy called Eric Hansen. You might be familiar with him. I think the, the last book he bought was by Eric Hansen. Yes. Um, and he's, he's, so he's, he's an old guy on the bus, very sarcastic, uh, very sharp sense of humor, a lot of dark secrets. And again, it's, it's watching this transformation from this character. Um, so the, the, the premise is that it's an old people's coach tourists that is you know, big, a big one last shindig. It's their weekend away. They're getting old. They know they're going to be living with the worm soon. Um, so this is the, the last chance to let it all hang out. Um, but it, it's sort of like a, an apocalyptic story as well. So, yeah. you know, these guys are on this person, the, the world is ending, or, you know, to some extent. Um, so it's and, uh, watching this, ex, you know, this, this character, Eric Hansen, um, just sort of grow as part of that because he's, been, he's pigeonholed himself for such a long time, but then just watching him grow into this different person, you know, mm -hmm. throughout the stages of the story. So I, I think that was quite an interesting and it's, it's a, a very different character from, from when we start the story to when we finish the story. And I like to do that. I like, I like to, to, you know, take the reader on a journey of not just through locations but through a character's life as well and i think mm -hmm. this one is, is really good at doing that um so yeah so one last shindig watch out for that one it, it's it's a it's again it's 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 funny it's a black comedy uh in my in my mind the best piece i've written today and i'm very excited to see that come to light for sure and it's named um after someone you know do you do that a lot with your characters and you said eric hansen the author is um one of the main characters no, he, he pleaded with me. He pleaded with me to go into, into my next my next novella. Yeah, he pleaded. You know, he, he offered to pay me. But I said, no, I'll do it for free. I'll do it for free. I'll, I'm going to put you through a lot of torment just for free, Eric. It'll be a pleasure. No, he's, he's, he's a good kid, Eric. He's, um, the, the, the book you bought is great, actually. I'm, I'm sort of halfway through. I keep promising I'm going to finish it, but I just wanted to get this out of the way. But yeah, he's, he's, the, the way he writes is, yeah, it's flawless. And do you know when we'll be able to expect the lash and dig i don't i don't yet know that there's a there's a few in the queue i know i've got uh flight of the crow coming out in december uh gone to the dogs is coming out in in march uh nature's perfume they're all novellas yeah i'm taking a break from writing short stories um but saying that i've got two short story collections on submission at the moment um which is essentially the best of the best you know i've, I've written 120 short stories but these are the, the creme de la creme and both collections are, I'm, I'm really proud of them. Um, you know, I mean, I, writing short stories for me was, was a way of, of mastering 
well, I'm still a hack to some extent, but you know, mastering telling a story uh, succinctly. And I think before you even, okay, people will disagree, but I think before you even try a novella or novel, you have to hit out a few short stories just in terms of learning the structure, um, character development. And I think it's just a really, really good way of sharpening the tool. Um, so now, you know, I've, I've done that. I've, I've done the hard graft. You know, I've, I've had my nose to the grindstone. I've been, you know, doing short stories for nine, two and a half years. So now I feel it's time to, to grow into the next stage, which is the novella. And yeah, I mean, at the moment, I've got no inclination to, to write a novel. I think it's, um, I think novellas at the moment seem to be hitting a spot in terms of the attention span of people. Uh, but that's not to say I won't ever do it. I will get to it at some point. I'm excited to see what you come up with. I kind of consider every novella as its own little tiny world that I get to visit for a little while and, and escape my yeah. own and then kind of come back to reality when it gets a little too scary. And um, it just feels like something you can, that little yeah. corner of the universe that you can control. Um, I just love it. I appreciate everything you've written so far. I appreciate you coming here and talking to me, not once, but twice. <laughs> twice twice um, yeah exactly yes uh, yes we'll be yeah. old friends by the time this episode airs is there anything um any parting words you'd like to leave our readers before we sign off for tonight i just think if you want a um a quick escape then nana is a good place to start in terms of getting used to what towers is all about i reckon um it's, it's tongue-in-cheek it's, it's light-hearted it's not too heavy and you know I think that will give you a good idea of the, the sense of humor and if we sort of connect for future stories as well. Um, but like, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff coming out. I've got some good stuff coming out in the No Sleep podcast soon. I've got a five-part series on the Grey Rooms called Descent into Hell uh, coming out soon as well. Some great anthologies, uh, 1986 mixtape from uh, The Dread Machine and Generation X from Dark Inc. So some really good 80s themed stories in there, uh, which I'm an 80s boy, so that's cool. Well, thank you so much again for meeting with me and talking and for your wonderful work. Pleasure. Thanks, Melanie. Take care. Catch you later. Once again, thank you, Mark Towes, for being a guest on the podcast today. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others, post about it on social media, or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest from me, you can follow me on Instagram at the underscore southern underscore bruja. Thanks for listening.